I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you the latest news from the battlefront, discuss the announcement that BAE Systems will explore local manufacturing and direct deals with the Ukrainian army, and we analyse tank warfare amid some surprising statistics in the full-scale invasion. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield, to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Friday, the 1st of September, one year and 189 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, I'm joined by our associate editor, Dom Nichols, industries editor, Howard Musto, and former tank commander and Telegraph contributor, Hamish de Bretton gordon Well, hi, David. Hi, everybody. So, first of all, let's start in Moscow. The Moscow mayor, Sergei Sobyanin, he said that Russian air defences this morning had shot down a drone that was approaching the city. He said the drone came down near Libertsky, which is about 10 k's southeast of Moscow, just on the or just outside the ring road, actually. Moscow's Vinokovo airport was briefly closed, as it has been each time there were these, these incursions, but it resumed operations from just before half seven this morning, local Moscow time. Now, Ukraine's military intelligence agency says that the drone actually hit a, a factory that manufactures microchips used in missile production. And there are videos on social media, and you'll, you can see them as well in our, in our live blog, that shows uh, a very large plume of smoke rising over the southeastern suburb, Libertsky. We can't, the, the images I've seen, you can't actually see a, you know, a factory saying, microchips built here type of thing but you know there's, there's something that's clearly on fire now Sir, uh, Sergei Sobin in the, the mayor he did say there were no casualties or damage according to initial reports now so that might indicate that his initial response saying that that you know nothing nothing to see here gov was the usual knee-jerk reaction and not actually true so we wait to see more news of that and any any confirmation of what what was hit there Separately, last night, a Russian or a a number of cruise missiles hit across the country. One cruise missile hit the Ukrainian region of Vinitsia. So this is about 150 k's southwest of Kiev. Damaged property caused a number of injuries. The local governor, Sergei Borzov, he wrote on Telegram this morning and said, unfortunately, there are victims. They are being provided with all necessary assistance. And connected to that, Kiev's air force said that it had shot down another cruise missile over the central Kirovarad region. So this is right in the middle of the country, just west of the Dnipro River, west of Dnipro, west of Zaporizhia cities in that area there. Now, separately, Deputy Defence Minister Hannah Malia, she said this morning, uh, talking about the, the counteroffensive, there are certain successes in particular, or oh, crikey, all right, strap yourselves in, everyone, in particular in the Nova Danilivka to Nova Proper proper crikey nova proper papivka direction okay basically we're in the south of the country southwest the western edge of the zaporizhia oblast so that was the quote i tried to quote i'm sorry i'm sorry i got a, a mangled that but basically the three axes of advance that we've been talking about recently this is the furthest west the one that is having the arguably the most success it's the main area of advancement down near the town of Robertina. So Hannah Malio is saying that that is, that they're acknowledging certain successes there. There are reports of Ukrainian reconnaissance elements that have been seen east of Russian positions in the Vobovi area. This is about 5Ks uh, east southeast of Robertina. Now that follows on from geolocated footage published Wednesday and cited by US think tank Institute for the Study of War that shows Ukrainian infantry on the northwestern outskirts of Vobova. So if they're pushing into that area, if they're pushing further from east, east from Robertina, these, obviously, if they're reconnaissance elements, they're not there to hold ground. They have, they have a sniff about and see what's what. But if there's geolocated footage that shows Ukrainian infantry holding positions on the northwest of the town, that is that is a development in the last few days. Now, this footage obviously doesn't indicate that Ukraine has established 
control over that area at any time. And Russian mill bloggers, some of them, the ones that, that do occasionally we think are accurate, they have claimed that Ukrainian forces have not yet breached the defensive line around Verbove. Quite what Again, you've got to think about what you mean by the line. Do you actually mean the anti-tank ditches? Do you mean the dragon's teeth? Do you mean the sort of belt of trenches? Because, of course, there's not just one line. There's, there's, there's numerous troops all over the place, anti-tank teams, machine gun teams, all the rest of it. So quite what we mean by when, when we're talking about, or certainly the mill bloggers, if they say they've not yet breached the line, we've just got to be a bit careful about whether we're uh, comparing apples and oranges type thing. So Deputy Defence Minister Hannah Malia, she also said similar advances have been made in Bakhmut. She said defence forces there continue to conduct offensive actions south of the city. Uh, that has been confirmed by geolocated footage. There's heavy fighting, or she says heavy fighting continues in the area of Klishkiva, Kurjimivka and Avdrivka. There are certain successes. That's backed up by Ukrainian Eastern Grouping of Forces Commander Colonel General Alexander Sursky. He said that his forces have been gradually advancing despite a number of counterattacks. I said the most intense engagements were around those areas that, that Hannah Malia just mentioned. So Andrivko is about 9 k's southwest of Bakhmut. Kurjimivka is a little bit further on, about 12 k's southwest. And Yahidna is directly to the north. Those encounters are reported through Russian mill blogger channels as well, although some of them are saying that Russia, Russian local counterattacks have achieved some successes to the south. But that is disputed. It's, it's, it's very volatile, active and changeable around there. Now, elsewhere, Ukrainian chief of the main director of missile forces and artillery and unmanned systems of the general staff, which is surely a business card you wouldn't want wish on your worst enemy. But Brigadier General Sergei Baranov said Ukrainian forces have reached parity in counter battery capabilities with Russian forces. So we're talking artillery now, counter battery, or a group of artillery systems is called a battery. You have squadrons, or in the UK parlance, you have squadrons of tanks. The US have, have companies. We all have companies of infantry, but you have batteries of artillery. So a small number of artillery guns called a battery. But counter battery capability is your ability to use your own guns to directly target the enemy's artillery. So if General Baranov is saying that there are, there's parity, that is quite staggering given Russian, we know Russia is a very, very artillery-led force. Parity is not ideal. The general statistic is an attacker needs a three to one advantage over a defender. That goes up to at least six, at least six or higher in an urban environment. But the point I'm making is that it's quite striking that if they're, if they're saying there's parity, but that in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be any massive breakthrough anytime soon. Now, Baranov did say that it was the NATO provided artillery systems with the ranges out to 40 Ks that have allowed Ukrainian forces to directly target the Russian artillery systems. So they're either destroyed or they've had to move, They the Russians have had to move them further away and therefore they can't directly impact the front line. So taken together that's where you get your parity from separately two ukrainian drones attack the russian town of uh, kurchatov so this is in the kursk region kursk region this morning which is just west of kursk city which is about 75 k's northeast of sumi in ukraine um no further details there but in a in a uh, it doesn't often speak Kirill Badanov, the head of uh, Ukraine's military intelligence, but he was speaking this morning, and he said that the drone attack a couple of days ago on the Pskov air base uh, was carried out from within Russian territory. He said the drones used to attack the Kresty air base in Pskov were launched from Russia. Four Russian IL-76 military transport planes were hit, and as a result of the attack, two were destroyed and two were seriously damaged. There is some footage to back that up. There was also a rumour on social media, I've not been able to verify, that a Tupolev Tu-22 was also damaged, but that, that has not, I've not seen that repeated for the last couple of days, so I think that may be wrong. And then just finally, uh, the first group of Ukrainian soldiers have completed their training on the US M1 Abrams tank. First vehicles due to arrive in the next, the next two or three weeks, we think. So this is about 200 Ukrainian troops that have been training at a U.S. military ground in Germany. This is, comes from a U.S. military spokesperson speaking to Politico. Colonel Martin O'Donnell said the U.S. is committed to expedite delivery of the 31 tanks to Ukraine by the fall. Expedite, meaning get them there as soon as possible. 
And we know that 10 of the 31 are undergoing refurbishment in Germany before being sent on. But yeah, we should expect to see some Abrams in there soon. I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more about that from Hamish in due course. But that's it from me for now, David. Thanks very much, Dom Nichols. Um, Can we go to our industry editor, Howard Musto? Howard, uh, you've been writing about BAE Systems, who have signed a deal paving the way to building British-designed light artillery in Ukraine, so in-country. There's quite a lot to unpack here, so could you just talk us through, you know, what is BAE Systems, why are they important in this sphere, and what might this mean for the Ukrainian army? Absolutely, absolutely. So BAE Systems, I mean, it's the UK's biggest arms manufacturer. It used to be called British Aerospace Engineering, then it merged up and acquired the systems part, which makes electronics and what have you. If it's UK arms and it's been made in the UK within the last century, it's probably been made by a company that's become part of BAE Systems or your Avros and uh, your Supermarines, they're all part of BAE Systems. And now it makes Britain's warships, its nuclear submarines, and most of its armour and hardware. And so this is quite a big deal for them because it means bringing Ukraine on as a long-term customer. And it's really a view towards making arms in the country, maybe under licence, maybe it will be a factory that they own, or maybe there'll be some sort of combination of that, making those those pieces of weaponry that have performed quite well in Ukraine, making them there. And there's quite a bit of history to this. The, these talks have been going on for months and months and months. And it's been a bit of a race as well, because there's plenty of makers of equipment like Rhein Metall who are also interested in setting up factories and getting their equipment built there as well. Howard, you spoke about how these talks have been going on. Why hasn't this sort of deal happened before? What, what's what been the change in the last few weeks um, to ensure that, that, that they've come out and said that we're going to do this? So I, I suppose these talks have been quite long term. There's been a lot of, of discussion about what precisely is needed. And I suppose we're also there's also a shift. I'll come back to that shift in a second. Since at least February, we've we've known that these talks have been going on. And and before that, the local big arms producer in Ukraine, you could you could borrow them from had expressed interest in bringing on a Western partner to, to rebuild their industrial capability so that they can make more of the things that are getting used and chewed upon the battlefield like artillery pieces or like personnel carriers. So this is this has been happening in the background slowly. And in terms in terms of that shift, I suppose we're moving from a stage where Ukraine is is simply receiving donations from the West that they can use and moving into a, a situation where they're thinking about the long term and the future where they will want to be able to make the kind of equipment that they've been using so successfully. They'll want to make it locally. They'll probably, if they can, they'll want to do it themselves, to use their own personnel, build up those skills and build up, I suppose, in in the medium to long term, that, that sort of industry that can build NATO standard equipment. And this is a faster way of doing it. And what's the reaction being in the industry and in both countries, what have you seen? Very supportive. BAE are quite pleased to have got to this stage where they've got this legal base in the country. Um, We don't know much about timings, about what will happen next or when. That's all to be ironed out and they're still sort of deciding. They're still talking to the Ukrainian military about what they need. I think they're going to start with a small artillery piece if they can in the country manufacturing that there. The reaction from Russia has been a lot less positive. Dmitry Peskov said that, you know, there will be a a reaction to any BAE-built factories in the country. So, yes, there there was a similar uh, pronouncement when Rhein Metall, the German maker of the Leopard tank, said that it was interesting in, in building a, a factory in the Ukraine as well. It's this is sort of it's it's generally how these deals tend to get done. If you're another country that's buying British or American or whoever's equipment, normally European sellers, it's quite usual to want to, to have a, a home base and to be able to, to do some of that construction yourself. And just finally, from me, what what do the next? I mean, they've made the announcement now. So, what do the next few months look like? Um, do we? You mentioned we don't really have a time span, but we know if we could guess, what should we, the, the civilians following this war, what should we expect to see from now? So, BAE will be interested in in hiring local people to build up a, an office to really sort of hammer down what products they're going to be interested in making to try and iron out some deals as to what could be bought, who's going to pay for it. 
and then then I suppose sites will be chosen. That's that's the difficult bit. It's quite difficult to keep a factory location secret. On the security front, they've been quite tight-lipped, as you can imagine. If memory serves, I think when Ryan Mattel were talking about their own factories to build tanks, they were talking about protecting them if necessary. That's the big question. If you're gonna if you're gonna build a factory in Ukraine, where do you put it to keep it safe, and what might the reaction be? Well, thank you, thank you so much, Howard. Is there anything else um, we should talk about to do, to do with this story that our listeners should know and understand? I guess what will it will be interesting next is who else is interested because for these arms manufacturers. The war has been a very important proving ground and they've learned a lot from the donations that have been made to Ukraine, how they perform and what they need to do with them next. So it'd be very surprising if it was just the UK and Germany that were interested in placing factories here, doing long-term deals and building up Ukraine's industrial base. So watching out for others, particularly the French, who are very interested in industrial exports and what happens there will be very interesting. And then precisely what the Russian response is going to be, I think that's worth watching too. Howard must say thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Dom, can I come back to you? Before we go to um, Hamish and his and some of the points he wants to make, um, there are a few other political and diplomatic stories we need to cover. So Dom Nichols. Yeah, there's a couple of stories here from the, the diplomatic front, if you like. One one very, very grim, which I'll, I'll come on to in a moment. But firstly, on gas, Ukraine says it's ready to store and re-export European gas for the 23-24 winter. This comes from the, the country's gas transmission operator. They're citing risk assessment conducted with international partners. Now, this organisation runs Ukraine's gas system. They said that they've been doing stress tests to assess the risk to traders' ability to safely store gas in Ukraine and transport it to the European Union. The operator said that Ukraine's gas infrastructure had proved its high reliability and resilience, their words, in the crisis situations that they'd modelled. And in these stress tests, multiple combinations of transport routes connecting storage plants and various border points into the EU were confirmed, which will allow easy and quick switching between routes if there's a military action block, block one of them or for any other reason. Now, this came out of a notice published last night. The um, I'm not even going to attempt the, the whole name of the organisation, but the GTSOU is the abbreviation. That's Ukraine's gas transmission operator. They said gas storage at the moment is more than 90% full, which equates to about 93 billion, big B billion cubic metres of natural gas. And they, they say they need that in order to ensure a steady energy supply and the prevention of, of price spikes. So... Obviously, thinking about the first day of autumn today, thinking about the winter to come, Russia will try to weaponize that again as it did last last winter. So clearly, Ukraine can get its ducks in a row there. And then finally, this is terrible. So Interfax Ukraine reported yesterday that Ukrainian prosecutors say that Russian forces have tortured 75 children since the start of the full-scale invasion. They said most cases of torture took place in the Chernihav Oblast village of Yahidna, which was under Russian occupation for about a month. This is according to the Prosecutor General's, well, pro- sorry, Prosecutor General's Office representative. And then according to the head of the Department for Protection of Children's Interests and Anti-Violence, a woman called Yulia Yusenko, she said uh, Ukrainian authorities have opened 3,200 criminal cases over Russia's action against children. Ms Yusenko said, These include murders, mutilations, child abduction, forced displacement, deportation, sexual violence against children, attacks on institutions and facilities for children. Now, during the occupation of Yehidna, this was at the beginning of the full-scale invasion, uh, we know that Russian troops kept 367 residents. We know the number because they've, they've told us since, not the Russians, the Ukrainians that got out. 367 residents in a school's basement for 27 days and there were 50 children among those hostages 11 people in total died this came this is these are this is from the president's office prosecutors have also reportedly recorded isolated cases in Herzon and Kharkiv oblasts where children were detained and tortured and just finally Ms. Yusenko said that, that the Russians had claimed the children had provided the Ukrainian military with information about the movement of Russian military equipment now We've not been able to verify either of those things, whether or not the, you know, if the Russian allegation that that's what the children have done 
was correct. We've we've also not been able to verify whether or not they actually said it. So, you know, we've only got Mr. Yusenko's word to go on there. But, um, I mean, that's just an appalling story. It It's part of this pattern of deportations for which the International Criminal Court has put an arrest warrant out for um, Vladimir Putin. Um, but, yeah, I, I'm sorry, a bit of a grim story there to, uh, to finish the week on, David. Well, thank you very much, Dom and Howard, for your stories there. Um, Hamish Breton-Gordon, can we come to you? There's quite a lot of news to talk about to do with tanks at the end of this week. Can we start with a rather surprising set of numbers that you were looking at in regards to the survivability of Western tanks? I think that's a very good place to start, actually. Good afternoon, everybody. And yeah, thanks for having me on. Yes, tanks again, hitting the headlines. And I, I think a number of things here. I'll just cover a few of what, what I think is really important, and I'm sure Dom will, will want to chip in as well. There, there is a story in, in The National, which I helped Thomas Harding with yesterday, talking about the survivability of the Leopard tanks. Also, at lunchtime today, I've published a, a piece I, I, in The Telegraph with the historian James Holland. I feel a little bit guilty. It says James Holland, a historian. J- James is one of, I think, the greatest historians in the country at the moment and runs, I expect, a, a sort of sister pod to this pod called the We Have Ways pod with Al Murray, um, looking at all things war, all things Second World War. And... It's like the piece that, that I've written is very much the era of the tank is not dead, despite the fact it's been written off really since it was first used in a major fashion in the First World War at the Battle of Combray, 20th of November, 1917, and um, used a lot of historic examples also linking to what's happening in Ukraine. I'm afraid, Dom, most of the examples are about the Royal Tank Regiment rather than the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards, but I know the Royal Tank Regiment history a little bit better than I do the Scots Dragoon Guards. But what, one of the areas that we cover is, I mean, the three main attributes of the tank, fire, fire, protection and mobility. Uh, and I know we've discussed this a great deal. And the difference between Western tanks and Russian or Soviet tanks. The Russian very much focus on firepower and mobility, where Western tanks protection, that is physical protection of the crew is very important. So I think a lot of us who've been looking at this closely were very interested in the in the data coming out of Ukraine this week that of the 71 Leopard 2 German tanks that have been operating at the right at the front uh, in Ukraine, only five have been destroyed and no tank crew have been killed, which is quite phenomenal. There's a, a Ukrainian soldier called Oleg Selenko who said, you can repair a bit of metal, you can't repair flesh. And I think that moral component to this is hugely significant. So the fact that these tanks are heavily involved in contact, but not being taken out. And the reason, really two reasons, the, as I said, protection is a big thing for Western tanks, both Challenger 2 and Leopard 2 have excellent frontal armour, sloped armour. It's called, It's supposed to be super, well, it is super secret. The British stuff's called Dorchester. I don't know what the, the German stuff's called, but it's very, very effective. It's sloped. And really, the frontal armour soaks up any, Dom described a few weeks ago, the, the rounds, kinetic energy rounds, tungsten dart or depleted uranium dart, fired it 1,500 metres per second, punches through. But actually, with a leopard or a challenger, the armour will prevent that penetrating into the turret and injuring or killing the crew. Not the case with Russian tanks, T-72s, T-80s, etc. They don't have this sort of armour. Also on the Leopards and the Challengers, we have what we call bar armour that protects them against anti-tank guided weapons. Uh, and they also, as we've seen and discussed last week with Challenger 2s, they also have protection against drones. We're seeing a lot of drones, lots of pictures of drones with hand grenades being dropped into open turrets of of Russian tanks and blowing up. And that illustrates the second point, the reason that both the Leopard and the Challenger are not brewing up like the Russian tanks, because they have what we call armoured charge bins. So you have a bag charged with explosive in it, you have the the actual tungsten dart or, or the high explosive shell and the charge the charge bags in challenges and, and leopards are kept in what we call armored charge bins in other words if there's an explosion in the turret it won't then set off 
the bags, the bag charges, which is not the case with the Russian tanks. And that's why you see single grenade dropped into a T-72 or whatever. And then short time later, the whole tank blows up and explodes. So that, I think, is very gratifying. We still, the challenges are still moving around in mysterious fashion, gaining that sort of psychological myth that the Tiger tanks did in the Second World War. I think the final bit on the tank piece that was mentioned at the beginning here is the Abrahams. Abrahams is the American tank, very similar to Challenger 2 and Leopard 2 in performance. Slightly, I mean, the, the news coming out is 200 crew are now trained. And I think the piece said that the Abrahams would arrive in the fall. Now, my, my American is not terribly good, but I think the fall is the autumn. It happens to be the 1st of September today, which I think is the beginning of autumn or end of summer. So one one assumes that these Abrahams are perhaps in theatre, in the Ukraine operational theatre. Who knows it? To me, one of the significant things about Abrahams is they are a very simple tank to use. And that, that's what they were designed for, so that reservists in the American National Guard, etc., could jump in them and start operating them pretty quickly. So my, I, I must say, I haven't been in Abrahams for 10 years or so, but I do remember, actually, it's everything is fairly easy and intuitive to use, perhaps not quite like the Challenger, certainly Challenger 1, which is really unintuitive to use. Challenger too much better, but Abrahams, really easy to use and really effective. Great firepower, great protection, great mobility. It has a wonderful gas turbine engine that but push it along at great speed. The only downside there, perhaps it chews through a heck of a lot of fuel. So to me, those are the major tank things at the moment. And if people want to get learn more about it, do read my and James Holland's piece in the paper today. And, um, uh, and I'll be with him and Al Murray talking about this next weekend at their festival. So, so a- a- any comments on tanks? Much appreciated. Over. Thanks, Hamish. Well, You've certainly provoked a couple of questions in, in my head. How do you make a, when you say it's un, not, not particularly intuitive to use, what, what do you mean sort of in a, in a granular sense? I mean, what makes the Abrams tank uh, easy to use and what makes the Challenger quite difficult? And, and wh- why might they do that? Is that just a just how the tank design evolved? Or, or, or were certain designers thinking, you know, actually, no, we need to make this easy for our operators because we're thinking of the training time? I mean, could you just go into some detail? Like, what, Why is a Challenger difficult to use for an operator? Well, you're absolutely right. So I think traditionally British tanks have been more complex because we focus very much on the, on the protection, armoured protection. So because you've got so much armoured protection and the turret looks quite big, but actually inside it, it, it's very cramped. Uh, and certainly the Chieftain and Challenger 1, to, to be able to, as the commander, you have to do a whole host of data entries and all the rest of it to make sure that the gun fired where you wanted it to fire and it it was just complex and even and you know without being super cynical the challenger 2 is is really just a derivative of the chieftain tank which was you know which is 60 70 years old so i, I think we never quite start, ch- started from scratch maybe people at vickers and now bae might be throwing darts at my, my sort of picture at the moment but it it was a development so i don't think challenger 2 didn't start from scratch it was a great deal easier to use but still when you're firing the gun there are a number of sequences that you need to go through in order for the gun to fire where you wanted it to go and inside the turret it wasn't very clean and tidy i think with the abrahams the americans decided to start absolutely from scratch from first principles so you look inside abrahams and the turret's clean. In a Challenger 2, the bits and pieces all over the place, quite before our squaddies get in there and make our own amendments. So the, the, the turret inside it clean, driving it, you actually have a steering wheel and it's automatic. In a Challenger 2, you have two levers, which basically stop the tracks to go left and right and that sort of thing. Although, you know, still driving is quite simple, but the drivers are also the people who keep the thing on the road. And with an Abrahams, it's very much plug and play. If there's something wrong with the engine, they whip it out and put a new one in. Yeah, in good old British fashion, it's we, we're more into get the Don 10 out, get a bit of wire out and, and keep it going. So, so you need things more there. And, and then when it comes to firing with, with a Abrahams, it very much put the aiming mark on what you want to 
shoot at, press a button, on off it goes. So I think, um, actually, Dave, you're absolutely right. It, it was there to make it really easy because so much of the American armoured Crews were based on reservists and National Guard who didn't actually have the time. They wanted something that was dead easy. You could, you know, you could go away for six months, come back in, have a quick refresh and you would go. Challenge two is not quite like that. You know, if you use it all the time, it, it it's really straightforward. But it, if Don or I sat back in a challenge or two now, we, we would need a, a half hour explanation on how to fire the gun and do all the other bits and pieces. I, I, I hope that's... Don might be able to add to that. I hope it's a reasonable explanation. Well, I think the first, if we tried to get back in now, Hamish, it would take half an hour for us to squeeze in the turret. I think our um, waistline might have precluded that. But look, I mean, you know, you're having to go at the dear old chieftain there. I served on chieftains, never served on Chally one, served on, served on chieftains, and it, which might be very old, but at least I can pronounce Abrams correctly and not keep going on about Abrahams. I think you're mixing up your tank feet back to remedial training. But no, it is it is very interesting that the all these systems together, down to and including the armoured charge bin, so that if any round penetrates the, the turret, it's, it's less likely to set anything off inside. It's all based around the idea of the, as you say, the crew can't really be replaced that quickly at all, if ever, the vehicle can. So start with that. Start by protecting the crew and then work outwards. That's what the Russians have tried to do with their T-14 Armata tank, although I saw last week a report saying that they've now shelved that project. So with the T-14 Armata, there, this was a three a three-man crew, so they were all in the hull, so the turret was completely automated, and that obviously means that the crew were better protected. I mean, not not impervious to everything, of course, but that the idea there was that the the the, the auto loader that they use on T on their tanks take that a stage further, and you can have a completely a completely automated system for the whole turret. But they've apparently binned it because it's exceptionally difficult to do. But I just wonder if they've if they've sort of stepped back from that, partly because they just don't have the culture of building these things around thinking about the crew first and the ergonomics. And you're right, the Chal- Chieftain and Chally 1, Chally 2 were a bit of a dog's breakfast on the inside with all, with bits stuck on everywhere. And that's before you put up your set of optics, which I had in my tank. That's another story. So, yeah, it, was, it, was, it wasn't, particularly, wasn't particularly clean, but it was all built around protecting, protecting the crew. And I just, I wonder if, and I, this is only speculation, I don't know this, but I, I wonder if... With, that, with access to these much better protected vehicles, and I'm including the kind of the Bradleys and the Strikers and what have you in this as well, um, whether the crews might be a little bit more um, gung hos too harsh a term, but whether or not they would, they might take risks as they would they might not otherwise have done if they didn't have such belief in the vehicle. You, you've got to have great confidence in your vehicle, but not too much. And I just, I will, I'm watching and I'm kind of you know almost through my fingers thinking god i hope i hope they don't go too far and take unnecessary risks i don't know hamish if you've if you've heard of that if you've seen any of that if you if you think i'm worrying unduly uh it's it's a great point dom from what i understand the tanks that have been destroyed have been by mines which have then stopped them and then attacked drones so but i i I haven't heard that but it is a good point it's a double-edged thing if you if part of the the whole whole sort of raison d'etre for tanks is shock action and if you can if you can use those attributes firepower protection and mobility to your advantage and get behind the enemy absolutely but of course still the western tanks the leopards and challengers are still a fairly small component of the ukraine armor which predominantly is is ex-soviet ex-russian but yeah i think it's a good point to look out for I'm feeling quite inadequate, really, on this podcast now. I think you you guys are both commanded tanks, and I don't even have a driver's license. So thank you, Dom and Hamish. Hamish, one more question for you on this. Just going back to your point of something I hadn't realised, really, was that tanks, uh, the use of tanks, had been attracting this sort of criticism. You know, the question, is the era of the tank over? For a very long time, I thought, you know, I thought that was relatively recent. In your view, do you think the criticisms that, or, or at least the sort of, the people who believe that, having watched what's happening in Ukraine, are they the same sort of arguments that were happening in the 40s and, and and before and and yeah i mean where do you stand on that well i i think it was of course don being a, a cavalryman a donkey walloper um the, the it was the first world war where everybody was arguing that actually there is still the place for a well-bred horse on the battlefield and uh, and then coincidentally when i was in in bosnia back in in the mid 90s one of the cavalry regiments um 
got, got horses out for, for recce patrolling in the mountains actually w- w- was very effective. But going back to the tanks, it's, I think there are always naysayers and, and w- with any technology, it's trying to stay ahead of the game. So with the original tanks back in, in the First World War, which basically had plate armour, uh, and what once the once the, the Germans started to use some of their artillery pieces in the direct fire role, as it were, then the the armor on those early tanks w- w- was no good at all, and and they their mobility they were notoriously unreliable. But having said that, they made a difference. It was thought that with the the, the advent of aircraft. It, and the wide use of it in the Second World War. And also at the beginning of the Second World War, the British tanks hadn't really moved on very much in the intervening time. And the Matilda I, which is a very sort of light tank, which was predominated in the expeditionary force in you know, 39 and 40 and really didn't, didn't do very well at all. People started to lose faith, faith in it. But actually, as, as things developed, because the interwar period, people didn't really do much development. As tanks developed during the Second World War, they became more effective. But it's a question of staying one, one, one step ahead. I think after the Second World War, everybody thought technology would take over. Why, why do you need, how can a big heavy beast have any, have any effect at all? And um, then we saw the Gulf Wars where, where tanks were used widely, but but against a a pretty weak enemy. And of course, they're expensive beasts. They take a lot of training. They, the logistic tail, in other words, keeping them fed with ammunition and fuel it is massive. So the view was, what, why couldn't we do something with something else? And and the whole drone thing, which which really started when, when in my last tour in Afghanistan in sort of 20, 2008, nine, when drones have started to be heavily used, we thought that the attack drone, the Reaper, etc., would, would negate tanks. But actually, it's we're seeing in Ukraine that you still need infantry. But on the a lot of people thought the infantry after the end of the First World War would be negated, but but by crikey, they're not. You still need infantry to hold ground, and you still need you know a, a metal a, a metal can, as it were, with a big gun on it that's well protected to um, punch through defences. I, I don't think anybody envisaged maybe two or three years ago that we would have a, a state-on-state conflict like we're seeing in Ukraine with the Russians and the Ukrainians using mass armour and mass infantry on the ground attacking through trenches. I mean, it's, it, it's bizarre how, how things develop. So I, I think that there are always people who, who will quite rightly question military capability and for something like a tank that has been you know 100 over 110 years now i think people would have thought technology w- would have um, would have replaced it and fundamentally the tank the challenger 2s we're seeing in ukraine are fundamentally not that different from the mark 1 tank that first went onto the battlefields in 1915 you know, it's a bit bit of metal with a gun on it with people inside it. So who knows? We're, we're, I don't know how much development is being done on the next tank. Dom's talking about the, 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 the Russian Almaty, where they're going. Of course, the other thing about Russian tanks, they only have three people in them. So they can get, get a slightly lower profile. We, we, we in the West go for four. So I, I think I think... I think the tank will be here for some time to come. And for Dom and myself, ex-Armoured Corps people, we, we, we hope the new Defence Secretary and all the planning that's going on in the future remembers that. Because I think when I, when I joined the Army, admittedly, that was in 1988, we had four tank regiments. We now have one. Uh, I think we had about 15 main battle tank regiments, uh, and we now have three. So, yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think it'll be around for a while. Well, thank you very much, Hamish and Dom. Just to say, of course, if you are a Ukrainian tanker or know people, know Ukrainians who are training with, especially British tanks and maybe Abrams tanks as well, do get in touch. We'd be very, very interested to hear about your experiences learning with British and American armed forces and what you think of the technology and how long it took you to learn it. I'd be very interested to test uh, Hamish and Dom's theories about about the sort of the, the ease potentially of the Abrams tank and the difficulty potentially of the Challenger uh, of, of the Challenger tanks. So if, if you are listening and you're a Ukrainian tanker, do please get in touch. It'd be very interesting to hear from you. With one eye on the time, let's move to our final thoughts, I think. Hamish, I know 
you want to speak about nuclear brinkmanship, but we'll, we will if you would go last, that'd be great. And Dom Nichols, would you like to start? Dom Nichols. Sure. Thank you. And yeah, echo the call for, for any, any Ukrainians who've been training on tanks. Very happy to chat. And we will, of course, respect any uh, uh, OPSEC. We'll all just, it'll just be treated as uh, good back, background knowledge. Um, I, just a piece, uh, one piece of news to link here. So uh, Putin is going to meet uh, Turkey's President Recep Tayyip Erdogan on Monday. We he- heard in the last couple of hours they're going to meet in Sochi, the Black Sea coast city in southern Russia. The Kremlin announced it, like I say, in the last couple of hours. One of the things they're likely to talk about is the Black Sea grain deal, getting the uh, getting the, the deal going again, if possible, or rather this will be the next the next session, the session of, of what are Russia going to demand to get back into the grain, the grain deal. But I just want to pause for a moment and, and think about the Black Sea and the grain deal, because that was the focus of this week's Defence in Depth video, which you can, has gone up today. You can see it on, have a look at Telegraph, YouTube, you'll find it. But in that, I start off by, by talking about the Black Sea, and I take a step back and say, look, I come from a point of view that this is an illegal war. There are no legitimate actions. Had the the deal with artist Pabriks some time ago, but this is an illegal war. There are no legitimate uh, targets. With that in mind, though, having said that, the global community has come to the view that there is an international armed conflict in place. Now, I know that might sound a statement of the blindingly obvious, but these things mean something. If the international community deem an international armed conflict to be taking place, then certain rules of law, rules of war come into place, which confers rights, but also responsibilities on the belligerent parties. And also Turkey, who's custodian of the Montreux Convention, that convention regulates maritime traffic through the Turkish Straits into the Black Sea in times of warfare. Turkey has enacted the provisions under that under the Montreux Convention. So, yes, it's an illegal war. There are no legitimate actions, but we need to also hold in our heads that that there is there is a war going on, and therefore you need to differentiate between within that war. Forget how illegal it was that started it. There are legitimate and illegitimate actions that can take place. Now, we, we it's it's blurry, obviously, and morally very unpleasant, but we have to hold that in mind, I think. And I posit in today's video. August the 13th, when we saw Russian troops firing at that merchant vessel in the Black Sea, then boarding the ship by helicopter, searching the crew at gunpoint, all that kind of stuff, and then letting it go on the way. There was outrage at the time. Ukraine said the action violated the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. They called for the international community to take action. What I say in the video is Russia was entirely correct and legitimate in the action that it took there. The reason I say that is because... If we accept that there's an international armed conflict, there is, under the rules of naval warfare, this provision that allows for what's called visit and search. Visit and search allows a belligerent party to stop, not not kill everybody and blow the ship up, but stop a merchant vessel underway to discover the the purpose of that ship's transit, where it's going, what it's carrying, and so on and so forth. What happened on August the 13th was legal, within the bounds of this is an illegal war, but within the bounds of the rules of naval warfare, what they did was ele- was was legal and they did it in accordance with how they should act. There was no violence, bar a few warning shots, which I know is scary, but you know, nobody was hurt. The vessel wasn't damaged, it was searched and allowed to go on its way. Now, I mention that because Russia would like us to think at the moment that there is a blockade of of Ukrainian naval ports. And we need to dig in very briefly and i only spent a few minutes on the video but trying to explain what we mean by blockade comes from the 1856 declaration of paris and it means a blockade is a lawful method of warfare designed to prevent ships of all states from entering or leaving coastal areas under enemy control to deny the enemy money from its exports or benefits from imports that are going in there but in order to have a blockade and and once a blockade is in place under the laws of naval warfare you are allowed to go and take action up to and including sinking merchant ships okay but under the blockade has to be declared so you've got to say these are the dates these are the places this is the lat long and so on and so forth and it has to be effective and what an effective blockade means is that you have to put your own assets in harm's way you have to be able to put you know affect the blockade you have to put it in place which russia hasn't done obviously most of the black sea fleet is now in novorossiysk the um Moscow is at the bottom of the ocean, bottom of the Black Sea. Russia is not enforcing a blockade. And if they're not enforcing a blockade, they are then not allowed to go and meet violence out upon merchant vessels in the Black Sea. Look at July the 30th this year, just a few weeks ago. Six merchant vessels 
left left Odessa and and left the Black Sea. They, that was the in once the Green Deal had collapsed, they they took the chances and they and they went for it. And they were not stopped. So there is no blockade in place. And then if you think also of mid-August, the Joseph Schult, which was a, and I think it had about 2,000 containers, 30,000 odd tons of cargo, um, went into the Black Sea, uh, b- b- you know, displaying its AIS, the automatic identification system. So everyone knew where it was and went and docked in, in Odessa. So why wasn't that ship interdicted if Russia was putting in place a blockade? And it's because it was flying, it was operating under the flag of Hong Kong or to give it its correct title whether you like it or not these days china so russia is trying to have all its blockadey cake and eat it with none of the responsibilities it's not stopping merchant vessels it does definitely does not want to stop a chinese merchant vessel because that would really upset president 11 back in beijing so putin is trying to have it both ways it's a typical russian fudgy thing all the rights no responsibilities we need to be very careful here it's we need to be clear in our own minds about where the legality is and whilst we are absolutely right to criticize russia for starting the war and and sticking to the side that it is an illegal war we must be careful to get the legalities around the laws of war correct over such things as visit and search over such things about what is and what is not a blockade and what you are allowed to do if you effect a blockade and if you only have what's called a paper or constructive blockade, it's not real, I just tell you I've got a blockade, I'm not actually putting my stuff in harm's way, I'm not able to put it in place, then I don't get the rights of, of doing all the other blockadey stuff. And I'm happy to talk about this this legal, the, about Russia, when, when Russia's actions are correct and are not correct, because if they want to play ball in about law and what they can and can't do, fine, let's get them in a law court, uh, in a court of law, Let's talk about what's going on in accordance with the law. Remember Al Capone, that other gangster, he got done for income tax fraud. He wasn't done for gangsterism. So if Russia want to play by laws and what they can and can't do, then great. Let, let's see them in court. A bit of a long-winded way of ending the week, but go and have a look at Defence in Depth on Telegraph YouTube, and hopefully that will make it a little bit clearer. But I'm not saying that this was a, a legitimate act to start this war. I'm just saying that within the confines of that, and accepting that the international community agrees that there is an armed conflict and therefore other provisions about the laws around warfare come into place. And we need to know what they are, because at the moment, Russia is trying to play the edges and have it have it have it both ways. Thank you very much, Dom Nichols. Hey, Mr. Bretton Gordon, would you like to have the final thoughts for this week? Yes, thanks very much. A story that slightly got lost yesterday in the uh, announcement of the new defence secretary was by Daniel Sheridan and um, Tony Diver, the um, US Telegraph correspondent, who, who bizarrely misses DBG taught at primary school in Suffolk, I've now worked out or been told. But it's about um, the uh, building of nuclear bunkers at RAF Lakenheath, which is the US, big US Air Force base in the UK, and the deployment of F-35s. To which would deliver those tactical nuclear weapons. So these are Russian tactical, nu- these are American tactical nuclear weapons. UK does not p- p- possess tactical nuclear weapons. We have our Trident, uh, Trident subs. Uh, that's our nuclear deterrent. I was explaining to Danielle about uh, Greenham Common, RF Greenham Common and Greenham Common Women, which um, she was far too young to remember, as I expect. Um, you, you guys are, are running the pod are as well, but RF Green and Common was is where the uh, U.S. tactical nukes used to be stored, and there were always massive protests around it. Uh, and they moved out in 2008, I think it was. But very significant that uh, the U.S. should feel, first of all, that that it can put nuclear weapons back in the U.K. and that we we should allow it, but also the fact that they they feel they have to. And it's all this nu- nuclear brinkmanship. So the the brinkmanship is based around really from day one of the Ukraine war where Russia have threatened nuclear attack. And only this week, another ex-Russian general has said that Putin should drop a tactical nuke on Crimea to stop the counteroffensive. So and I think it goes back to red lines, and I don't want to rehearse arguments that we've been through as well, but the the the, the red line that Obama created in September 2012, saying that use of chemical weapons 
would cross the red line. Of course, in August 2013, Assad used massive amounts of the nerve agent sarin, which killed 1,500 people, and then the UK and the US uh, voted not to do anything about it. So that whole brinkmanship really dissolved then for a long time. But, you know, the Cold War was over. There was no great sort of east-west threat at the time. But that's all changed now. And I think it's a realisation by the UK and the US particularly that actually the, the, the way to stop any nukes being used is to reinforce your strengths. The whole deterrent is based on mutually assured destruction. I think the Russians think there's a bit of a grey area with tactical nukes, but to ensure that they understand that there's no grey area, actually the positioning of these US tactical nuclear weapons in the UK is is tantamount to that. So I personally think it's a very good thing because absolutely the last thing that anybody needs is the use of the Russians thinking that they can use a tactical nuclear weapon in Ukraine. Anyway, I, I've, I, I have written a piece about this. I think it'll be out in a few days' time. But I think it, on the whole issue, I, I feel more comfortable that the Americans are getting on the front foot with this. No doubt people will take issue with it. But actually, to prevent any nuclear conflict is the most important thing. And if it means that we've got to have a few nukes on our, our, our land, then so be it. Hi, listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to our reporting day after day. Just a quick thing from me. The deadline for the British Podcast Awards is fast approaching, and we'd love it if you would enter this podcast for the Listener's Choice Awards. If you would like to nominate us there, just go to www.britishpodcastawards.com forward slash voting and vote for Ukraine the latest there. We'll put the web address in the show notes. Thanks again. Ukraine the Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. We'll sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Giles Gear, and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.